É, muito obrigado, Aaron. Muito obrigado, Megan. É, lembrando a todos que a gente está recebendo perguntas aqui já. Já tem um monte de perguntas aqui. E eu já queria começar com alguma de, com uma delas. É, começar com uma pergunta mais aberta, que é para os dois. Onde e como os jornalistas podem aprender sobre gerência de produto? As escolas de jornalismo não ensinam isso e não há muitos profissionais no mercado. Uh, so I'll start and then you can... so... So that's another big problem that we're, oh, this is weird, I gotta take this down here, okay. Um, that's another huge, huge, huge problem, is how do you learn these skills? How do you understand what product management's about, what product thinking is about? And, I want, and I want to distinguish between the two things. You can, you can and should apply product thinking to what you do on a daily basis. Every journalist could benefit from that, right? And I was the biggest skeptic on the planet, and I've completely come around on this, just FYI. You can understand and use product thinking in your day-to-day -day job without becoming, literally changing careers to become a product manager. That's number one. Number two, where are these skills? First of all, there's tons of online um, uh, training available. It's all extremely generic, however, through things like Code Academy and other online training uh, outfits. You can get training generically on product management. What we want to do, though, is design and develop. We're working with my, the project that I'm actually now representing, which is called News Catalyst. You can find us at newscatalyst.org. We're working with a couple of partners to develop a formal training program for specifically for journalists, specifically around media. Uh, and we'll have much more to say about that in the coming weeks. But that's like, to my mind, one of the big missing components here is is that you're not being taught this at journalism schools, you're not being taught this in newsrooms, and we need to fix that. Yeah, I would, I would definitely point to online resources, and that um, sounds like you all will have an awesome uh, resource in a couple of weeks. Um, for me, it's been much more just naturally um, thinking about how the user is going, a user is going to see and use your product. How are they going to come into contact with it? How are they going to interact with it? Will they understand what the purpose of your project or product is? All of those questions you constantly just have to be thinking. Okay, if there's someone walked into the room, would they understand and be able to use what I've created? And if the answer is no, you have to, you know, tweak and work, keep working um, to refine your product to, to get it to a point where it's something that's accessible to people, they know about it, um, they can find it, and then they know how to use it. É, acho que essa pergunta pode ser para os dois, é, mas principalmente para a Megan agora. É, Megan, qual é o perfil da equipe e quais são as principais lições que você aprendeu ao construí-la e como tem feito para mantê-la? Acho que isso vale para o Aaron também, quando você trabalhou né, em outras redações, quais foram as lições que vocês aprenderam? Yeah. Um, I'm lucky in that I am not the, the ultimate boss on my team, <laughs> so, um, but I do work, obviously, uh, with my boss, Troy Thibodeau, to, uh, to do hiring and to, to um, obviously manage uh, the focus on my side of the team. And um, one of the things we put a real uh, very high um, value on is um, team cohesiveness and um, team learning. Um, so we've done a lot of step backs um, with our team to talk about kind of what personality types are we? What kind of communication styles do we all have? What kind of things do we prefer in our workplace that will allow us to work better together? Because our team is extremely, um, just we're very different people. Um, but we're, we're awesome together, um, and our, our work life is really fun, in part because we know how to talk to each other, in part because we've kind of set these higher standards of here's how our team is going to work. 
Um, and I will say, like, that's helped us in recruiting and in hiring interns and other team members um, because they see us working together so well. So the background of our team, um, I'm a traditional journalist, uh, you know, when, was a reporter, um, but we have people on our team who were math professors before joining AP, who were public policy analysts and have um, a ma you know, master's degrees in that. Uh, my boss is, you know, a poetry, uh, has his PhD in poetry. Um, you know, there's all of these different people, um, but setting those guidelines of how you're gonna work together and how to best talk to each other uh, is really important. One of the things we have on our team is we have dedicated time for learning so we have lots of training time. And we also have something we call the 15 minute rule, where you can work on a problem alone for 15 minutes, but if you are stuck, you have to ask someone else for help. So that really um, fosters collaboration and communication. Yeah, so lots to, um, I'm, I'll try to pare this down to, panel. this could be, <laughs> it, it has been its own panel. So I would say, you know, same, in the same way that, that um, Megan's team functions over, sort of organically. That's how the teams that I have run also kind of function. Uh, we launched a team in 2007 inside the New York Times of coders, designers, developers, uh, and didn't know what the hell we were doing, had no idea what we were doing actually. I mean, for, it took us two or three years to even realize that what we were making was product. Uh, before that's kind of, we sort of embraced that idea. And we, we did this extremely um, organically, made a lot of mistakes. I would say the following. Uh, I, gr I gained a very healthy respect for process, having a clear process in place. And I am not a process-oriented person at all. Ask anybody who's ever worked for me, they will tell you he is not a process-oriented person. So for me, this is very much going against the grain. Having a boss or someone high up who can be the bridge to the rest of the organization and, and who can fight for the team is super important. If you don't have that, you're kind of screwed. Uh, making sure that, unfortunately, journalists tend to be a bit on the xenophobic side. We are, almost by nature. We're always intimately, uh, we're always talking about who is and isn't a journalist, and we're kind of obsessed with it, and I hate to say that. It's, it's one of our least attractive traits, I mean, to be really honest, it really is. And so, when you start talking about, oh, this person's a coder, not a journalist, and it's like, you know what, actually, this person is doing journalist just like you are. Uh, it just happens to be in code. You know, I always used to, we, you know, I always used to say, like, we, years ago launched a, a project around documents called Document Cloud and, um, and we celebrate the, you know, this sort of uh, uh, what we call shoe leather reporting, right? So if you go out and you get a bunch of documents, you print them out, you sit on your basement floor with a yellow legal, with a yellow um, uh, magic marker highlighter and a yellow legal pad and you go through those documents painfully over, you know, whatever, months or weeks. We celebrate that as great shoe leather. Boy, that person, that's a great, that's a great piece of shoe leather reporting. You import those documents into Document Cloud, you OCR them, uh, and then you do that same exact thing in about one-tenth the amount of time, and that's suddenly not journalism anymore. I've never understood it, and I think we gotta get away from it. So getting this, start killing this sort of who is and isn't a journalist uh, mentality, I think we need to really, really get over that. That's one of the biggest cultural barriers we face. I will say, um, too, sorry, one more thing as Aaron was talking. One of the things that has dramatically helped our team in terms of keeping focus um, on product and kind of turning some of our projects into products is, is having, um, we have very well-defined and well-set goals that we continually review and come up with. So our team collaboratively comes up with annual goals um, and then we do have quarterly goals as well. And we have them both for the team and for individuals. One of those goals on our team has to be a learning goal for each person. So they have to set some kind of learning um, objective for the quarter. Um, but having the, the big picture 
uh, annual goals for our team keeps us moving forward instead of running after the latest breaking news and whatever project some editor has come to us with that day um, and keeps us focused on the bigger picture. See. É, se vocês me permitem um follow-up desse assunto, é, acho que acho que esse tema pode ser um pouco muito estranho ou alienígena assim para para temática ou para o clima de uma redação. Como que vocês fazem para não perder a visão do jornalismo no processo? Porque são, é um mundo completamente novo e eu acho que pode ser também uma questão que pode fascinar equipes em se tornarem muito orientadas por processo, mas aí o jornalismo e aí no fim se perde. E aí como é que vocês fazem para manter esse equilíbrio? Uh, so I'm going to answer your question by rejecting the premise. Um, uh, I I think we have this mental image of what journalism is, and you know it's always this very romanticized, in my view, overly romanticized. Usually, we've watched All the President's Men perhaps one too many times. <laughs> and that's our view of journalism. Now, that's doing journalism. And I don't agree. I think the answer to the question is we need to stop thinking of journalism in antiquated and arguably uh, obsolete ways. And we need to start thinking about how we can actually apply process, we can actually bring new skills, new methodologies, new approaches in that in aggregate in the end can result in much better journalism. So, there. <laughs> How am I going to follow that? <laughs> Um, I will say one of the things we've noticed with data distributions to, to take this question a totally different track. One of the ways we've, um, we've, one of the things we've had to deal with in data distributions is we have this kind of loose agreement with our members who do pay us for, um, for data distributions. Uh, not a whole lot, but it works. Um, and, and we've promised them a certain amount of data. And honestly, data projects, um, as you all well know, as data journalists, don't really come in on a regular <laughs> schedule. Um, you find flaws in the data that you didn't anticipate. It takes you longer to do some cleaning or get, you know, get back FOIAs. Um, it's not really a schedulable thing. Um, so one of the things I constantly have to do is, is this juggling between our journalism and our product. Um, you know, and it, it's never a, a perfect balance, to be honest. Uh, you know, we sometimes have months where we don't do a data distribution because everyone on the team is working on a big project and a, and a story fell through, which happens all the time. Um, you know, and we don't want to lessen our journalistic standards by just putting out some data set that we really don't believe in or trust in. So we'll go a month without doing something and then we'll do two in, you know, two weeks. Um, it, it's just the way the editorial schedule works. But that is, there, there is a, a push-pull between knowing that I have to deliver a product and the journalistic calendar and editorial process, which is, does not really abide by those same standards. You know, we, we can't produce a widget every week. Like, it, it just doesn't work that way. Can I, I just have one more, uh, two more quick things. One, Peter Aldhouse. Peter Aldhouse, an incredible journalist, right? At BuzzFeed. He trained an algorithm to identify spy planes. Out of all the bazillion, quadrillion, quintillion uh, 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 flight paths of airplanes that you can get in this massive data set, he was able to train an algorithm to identify those needles in a haystack and wrote this incredible piece that revealed uh, what you couldn't have found any other way. So is training an algorithm journalism or not? I would argue it is, uh, because it has a journalistic end. So that's probably another answer. And the second thing I wanted to say is all the things that we're doing up here, the training I mentioned, SourceCon product and all the rest, all of that is happening because of the extreme generosity of uh, Google and specifically Marco. And I wanted to say that because I appreciate all the support and also we're in a public venue now and after I was just mean to you, I want to make sure that that's not in any way uh, endangered. O domingo estava só começando, Aaron. Sunday was, okay. was only starting. Obrigado, obrigado. We're on the record though, we're on obrigado. the record. Uh, bom, vou, vou fazer umas duas perguntas fáceis agora então. 
É, duas perguntas que estão relacionadas. É, para uma redação sem dinheiro e desmotivada, essa mentalidade de gerência de produto poderia ser um caminho para mudar essa situação? Se sim, como? E a outra pergunta que é parecida com essa é que, para a Megan, mas acho que também pode ser para o Aaron, produtos demandam tecnologia, tempo e desenvolvimento. Acha esse caminho compatível com redações enxutas e pressionadas? Como? Como eu disse, perguntas fáceis. Uau! Nada para impactar lá. Eu diria que not every journalism project needs to be a product. And um, again, like, like I said in my, in my presentation, you know, you have to do a lot of advanced thinking about what it's gonna take to get from an internal thing that you use and are familiar with to like what the world can use and make sense of. Um, for data distributions, it probably adds three to four work days minimum of like a, a whole person's time to get from like our internal data analysis for a story to, ver to, to what we share with our, our members. That is not an insignificant amount of time when you are doing that 20 times a year. That is like half a person's job. Um, and it's a different person, so we spread the pain around on our team a little. But it's, it's really something you want to think about. Like, um, You know, and, that, and that's really true we've found with every, with every product. We've, um, like I said, when we, when we released Data Kit the first time, we didn't have a marketing plan around our release. We just kind of thought we could push it out into the open source world and people would understand it and embrace it. And that did not happen because, um, you know, your communications around your product are really essential. And um, I think that that experience taught us a lot about how we talk about what we do and how we get people to understand what we do. Um, so the second time around this year, um, our product was much more usable. We had thought about how other teams might use it, and we had built other plugins specifically for outside use. We had a whole marketing plan around it. We got um, a product manager involved who reached out to some newsrooms. We did a lot of kind of like early seeding where I went to a conference and we were not ready to release it, but I just kind of chatted with people and got people interested and buzzing about our product so that when we did release it, there was some buy-in immediately and some familiarity immediately. And all that's kind of important. Does it take away from our journalism? I don't think it takes away from our journalism. It is definitely a time commitment, though. So you have to know that your team wants to do that. So focusing on the first part of those two very easy questions, <laughs> what, what do you do if you're working in a declining industry, a small news organization that's running out of money and running out of time. And this is one of the core questions that we're confronting through News Catalyst. This is what News Catalyst is all about. We are a two-year project designed to help local news organizations become sustainable businesses. And a big piece of that is product. So will product and product thinking save local news? No, absolutely not. I think But applying the methodology and taking a, an uncritical or a very critical eye to what you're producing every day and trying to think in terms of how can we serve readers, viewers, and listeners better, that just might. So when you apply, we spend an inordinate amount of time when we talk about local news asking these questions like, what can we do to get people to pay for local news? What can we do to get people to pay for local news? And it is fundamentally the wrong question. We're framing this entirely the wrong way. Because when you say that, it's basically the equivalent of coming up to somebody and saying, here is this bundle of stuff that we've done in pretty much the same way for 150 years. Now, what do I have to do to get you to pay for this? How many times do I have to twist your arm? How many, way, how, many, how many artificial inducements do I have to push into this product to get you, to get you to pay for it? Totally the wrong question. What we should be asking is, what 
actually should we be doing? What can we do to create value that somebody would be then willing to pay for? What should we be doing and what shouldn't we be doing? What are we doing now that's pure commodity? What are we wasting? The Guardian had two, two horse racing journalists, two journalists who did nothing but write about horse racing. Their stories, to be generous, on average, were like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 page views, every one of them. And you start asking yourself, why are we doing this? Well, we need it for the paper is often the answer you get. Really? Are we so convinced that people want this important horse racing coverage in print, but not in digital? Really? So taking this idea of saying, hey, we're going to apply this framework, and we're going to start from the user and work backward to the product, rather than starting with this product and trying to get someone to pay for it, to my mind, that's actually what might save journalism. Deixa, deixa então discordar com a premissa da sua pergunta. Brincando. É, mas eu acho que tem, eu acho que isso, isso que você está falando, Aaron, é, fazendo o advogado do diabo, esse é o problema que nós enfrentamos hoje com diversas empresas no Vale do Silício. Esse foco obsessivo no usuário que acabou criando é, eco chambers, criou filter bubbles, criou é, grupos, assim, to, to, todo esse, esse desafio que a gente tem hoje com a, a, o reforço da sua visão de mundo por causa do foco obsessivo no usuário e o fortalecimento de padrões de comportamento que não são desejáveis, nos leva a crer que nem sempre o usuário, ou essa estratégia de focar no usuário, seria o melhor para o conjunto da obra, ou para o funcionamento da sociedade, do sistema como um todo. Como que esse desafio dialoga com essas questões que você acabou de colocar? Como é que o jornalismo não cairia nessa armadilha também? So I think it starts with what you're trying to achieve. And part of the problem that you're pointing to, and we're not going to name names, Facebook, is <laughs> that the, if the objective is purely we are going to build a global tool to engage people, by which I mean pure consumption, we want to get people to spend as much time with our product as possible. And that is our goal. That is our entire mission. And frankly, that's pretty, that defines Facebook's mission in a nutshell. Then, yeah, I mean, that's, that is what I would say is that that is the highest, that is the most, um, that is the most applied form of, of product thinking gone wrong. So what is the mission? If the mission of journalism is to inform, if your mission is to inform, if your mission is a more informed community, if your mission is to help get the bad guys and help, you know, whatever the cliche is, right? Comfort, comfort the afflicted and afflict the uncomfortable or whatever it is. If that's your mission, then, then your product thinking would therefore tend to optimize toward that. And that's not the same thing. That's not the same thing. So that, that's, that's why I'm, I guess I'll reject your rejection. <laughs> uh, to, to piggyback a tiny bit over what Aaron just said, um, one of the things, especially in, in, you know, shrinking newsrooms and demotivated, I mean, we're all, especially with the news cycles today, running at 100 miles an hour, right? And like, everything is, is, has to be fast. We're constantly being whiplashed across news stories and uh, topics and things like that. And I would really encourage you to get your newsroom in some way to, to step back and start thinking about what is our mission? What are our goals? Can we, can we collaboratively design a set of goals that we can all get behind and embrace and then move forward from there? And that takes some time. I mean, you have to, you have to be willing to invest that upfront time of we have to get everyone on the same page about the big picture until, before we can do any of the small stuff. And that includes what we cover on a daily basis, how we deal with projects, um, what are our investigative focuses for the next year. If you don't know what the mission of your organization is, how the hell are you going to serve your, your organization? Like you just, you can't, you're not gonna create any kind of meaningful product or long-term strategy if you can't define exactly what your organization is, 
is doing right, what your strengths are, and what you should be doing in the next year to get you to a new place. Ok. É, continuando nesse assunto que você estava falando, Megan, é, de definir a missão e definir é, para onde a equipe está indo e o que, que você vai fazer a partir disso, o que, que você tem pensado sobre isso hoje? Qual é, no século 21, com essa, todas essas mudanças, com a democratização da web, a transformação intensa da tecnologia no comportamento da sociedade, o que, que você tem pensado que hoje, para que o jornalismo serve? Como que ele se manifesta no meio digital e com quais propósitos? Né? Se não é só a replicação do jornal de papel num site, o que, que é que o jornalismo se presta a fazer hoje e como é que ele tira vantagem do meio digital? How have we moved to like saving all of journalism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good God! Oh. Um, sorry, this has just uh, gotten to a, a whole never meta level. Yeah, thanks. I mean, there is still and probably ever more so a need for truthful standard bearing news dissemination um, especially in a world where there's so many untruths and um, you know places who are interested in swaying um, what reality might be um, I think news organizations play an even more important role in, in informing the public. Um, but then finding your audience to be able to inform the public is a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure I'm doing yeah. a good job of answering this. Deixa eu, deixa eu tentar dar um pouco de contexto por que, que eu fiz essa pergunta. É, yeah. O Aaron colocou alguns slides ali com uma série de buzzwords de, de o que, que é inovação no jornalismo. E a gente lê muitos relatórios de que newsletters estão funcionando, ou podcasts, você deveria fazer mais vídeo. Então, tem uma certa obsessão com a criação de novos produtos que podem significar é, salvar o jornalismo, mas que, de fato, talvez não estejam sendo aterrados numa estratégia de para que esse jornalismo que você faz serve. né? E aí eu estava pensando como é que isso se conecta com uma... Que o Aaron também trouxe isso, e você falou, Mega, a gente estava conversando antes. É, como é que esse esse pensamento de ter uma missão, do que que você faz, é, os processos emergem a partir disso, esse pensamento de produto emerge a partir disso. Foi foi nesse contexto que eu fiz a, a pergunta, não, não era para ter sido uma, uma questão existencial, filosófica, sobre o que é o jornalismo. Look at all those buzzwords. I mean, just start with that. And by the way, that is not an exhaustive list. That was just the buzzwords that we came up with, a group of us just spitballing, you know, the things that we can all recall that were going to save journalism at some point. And we go through this, what I like to call binge purge cycle with this, right? Which is we all get really excited and obsessed with a specific thing. Right now, it's machine learning and AI. That we are square in the binge cycle there. A year and a half ago, all we were going to hear about was VR and AR. And the problem is, is that all of these, and now we fully rejected it, right? And there's other things up there that now we just laugh at. We go to a conference now, just go to a, con go to a conference like this and just go up to somebody and say, snackable content, and see what happens. That is usually what happens. People <laughs> laugh, right? And the same is true of AR and VR, right? The problem is, is that with, in the absence of a structured framework for understanding exactly what these tools are useful for and what they're not, and how that applies to a broader strategy and mission, this becomes innovation on its own. Well, it's not even innovation. I think it just becomes this sort of binge purge cycle. It becomes innovation theater is what it is. That's where I think, that's why we're stuck right now, in my view, is because we aren't applying this. So, I'll give an example, blockchain. Again, that's, everybody wants to laugh at blockchain. Blockchain is an incredible technology for certain things. And, and if we continue to just sort of go through this cycle where it's like, 
We all get real excited about something and then we eventually reject it because it hasn't singularly, set, magically saved journalism. Then I think we're going to be throwing away useful tools. These are all tools, that's all they are. And if you don't apply them, if you don't have the right kit and you're not applying them in a systematic, structured way, well, what is the point? I'm, I, there's nothing I can say to improve upon that answer. That's, that was really good. So, vamos falar de questões mais específicas, então. Tem uma pergunta da Natália aqui, que fala que é difícil pensar em inovação e produto em redações que são baseadas em silos e são super hierárquicas. A questão é a cultura de trabalho dessas redações. E como mudar? Yeah, I mean, um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna just walk into, be able to walk into your newsroom and be like, guys, I have this plan, product thinking, and everyone's gonna be like, oh, and like, it's everything is gonna change and be better. Um, you know, it's just <laughs> sorry to, but you know, you you start small. You find a, a project and a, possibly a person or a team who you can do something this big with. Um, but they can, that's going to be a success, that's going to work, and that other people are going to see working. Um, and, and from there, start rolling out, um, okay, you look, you know, remember that thing I did for them over there? Well, we could do something like this, um, you know, on a larger scale for our readers next year if we, if we really focus on this mission. Let's, let's try to attack that. And so... Um, you know, it's, it's incremental success, but success builds success, right? So, like, as soon as someone sees something that, that might be going well, um, that becomes very appealing to them. So, that's what I would encourage you to do. Yeah, this is the hardest question. And it is ultimately the goal, right? All of this ends up, we have to change. Culture is the biggest obstacle to everything that we're talking about up here. Um, and... I look at an organization like Quartz, for example. It's an all-digital startup. It was founded by The Atlantic about, a, what, it was a decade ago. It's now, it was spun off and recently sold. But Quartz has done, has launched, I don't know, a dozen fascinating product experimentations. They have gone through a full cycle, and in many cases, they have shut it down or changed or pivoted or launched something new. And they do it with this regularity that just is breathtaking. And it involves editorial, it involves journalists, it involves product, it involves technology. And I look at Quartz and I wonder, why is it so easy for Quartz to do these things and so hard for everyone else? Why? And the answer ultimately is culture. But culture, let's break that down. Culture goes to structure. It, grow, it goes to who's rewarded for what. It goes to what's the internal currency of, that we use to measure success or failure. It goes to all of these things. And if you're not thinking about this in a systematic way toward a, a strategy, you're lost. And you're just going to conti continue through inertia or habit or both, continue doing the same thing you've always done. And this is where it has to change. And for Quartz, I think it started at the top. Even though you had, it was founded by the oldest school of old school journalists, they created a structure that existed, at least at the time, almost nowhere else that I knew of. You had, for example, product and technology that sat in the newsroom and reported to the editor-in-chief. What? Oh my God, how can you do that? There has to be this wall between how this person's working on, they might see advertising, they might talk to advertisers, we can't have that. And well, no, Quartz seems to have managed that fairly well. You know, Zach Seward, who's now the CEO, yeah, he, he's navigated that pretty well. And so how is it, so to my mind, there's all of these elements that make up what we call culture. And I think we need to attack them systematically. I will say too, um, one of the things, if, it, if it's not gonna come top down, um, one of the things we've done is, is um, start kind of advocating for this kind of culture in really small ways all the time. So when we're having conversations with editors in the newsroom, we say, oh, you know, we had a retrospective last week on a, on a project we did. And everyone's like, well, what's a retrospective? And it's like, well, it's, you know, a structured way to review how a project went where we ask specific questions and we talk about ways we can improve them next time. And everyone's like, 
you've talked about ways you can improve our processes. Like that's like a completely new idea to a lot of reporters and editors. Um, so you know, how can we have those kinds of little conversations that can lead to some large scale cultural change? So now you know we've had retrospectives with most of the editors and reporters at the AP at some time or another, most of the teams. And they get it, and they're like, "We've never done anything like this. It's amazing. Like we, you know, we have three things that we can actually change and make better, so we never get into this like hairy situation we got into again." Um, so, so that kind of thing, like you know, even just forwarding, you know, here's a product article I saw um, to your bosses sometimes helps. Our team uh, has been pretty public. We have a we have a rubric as how we take on projects and what kind of meets our definition of a of a project that you know we we should work on, and we've made that public to to the newsroom, so everyone can see kind of like here's our mission. We we've actually also made our mission statement public to the newsroom. So like here's what our team's mission is. Here's what our priorities are. Here's how we judge what kind of projects we take on. Here's exactly a literally bullet pointed list. Does what you're talking about meet these, meet these goals, meet these definitions? Could it if we push on a couple of things? All those kinds of like open and transparent process type um, decision making, uh, you know, it, it, it helps kind of seed that mindset elsewhere in the newsroom, even if people don't know that that's product thinking. É, uma, uma das explicações para manter uma separação histórica entre igreja e Estado nas redações é o conflito de interesse que há quando você está vendendo anúncio para um anunciante que você possa investigar depois. Então, essa separação sempre foi salutar. Hoje, com a construção de novos produtos que não necessariamente pensam no faturamento é, de marcas, mas sim na construção de maior sustentabilidade para redação baseado no usuário, é, vocês pensam que esse conflito de interesse ainda existe? E se ele não existir, os jornalistas deveriam estar pensando em formas de crescer o seu negócio também? É, o que vocês pensam? I mean, you know, traditionally, yeah, that's absolutely separation, hard separation. I'm a reporter. I am neutral ground. I, I care not at all about the revenue side of things. Um, it's a little bit misguided. I mean, you know, our industry is in trouble. Like, I, I want to make money for my company so my company can continue to employ me and employ the rest of my team. Um, so that we can't not think about it anymore. Now, does that mean I'm meeting with advertisers? Absolutely not. Like, you know, the, does that mean we're going to sell our data distributions to a bunch of lobbyists? Absolutely not. But there has to be some kind of thinking about revenue. And, and I don't think that's so off topic anymore for the newsroom. Yeah, and so that, to be really clear, there is a hard wall at, at, at courts between sales and, and so forth. So Zach doesn't have, never did have anything to do with that part of the company. But their wall is definitely, I would say, more porous than most. And, and you know, I think it's an interesting example. And often, I, I would say more often than that, this question is brought up and raised as an excuse for editorial not to be involved in product development, product thinking. It's almost an excuse not to be engaged in the core of the business. And in some respects, this is why most product jobs at media companies are frankly terrible. Because product almost always sits outside editorial. It almost always operates on the business side. And if you're thinking about developing and designing and launching a new product, and the core product of what you do is news, how on earth are you going to launch a new product without the participation, the active participation of journalists? Right? And that process is incredibly hard. We did it, we tried to do this, and it was a spectacular failure. Well, actually, we tried to do this at the New York Times. Anybody remember this uh, product we launched years ago? We, I still say we. What they launched years ago called NYT Now. 
It was a mobile app. It was designed for younger people. That was kind of the goal. It was a lower price point. We did something that we had never done at the time. We put together a totally cross-functional team. It included editorial, marketing, it included ad sales, um, technology, design, UX. We were all in the same room together, and we all designed together. And at first, there was like a lot of like very prickly, like if somebody from marketing said something about editorial, all the journalists were like, mm, that's not your job. We're the journalist and you're not. And eventually, we all got over that. And eventually, within a few months, we all were working like a single team. And it worked really, really well. Editorial folks were giving really good ideas to marketing folks and vice versa. Until it was time to take that little magical team and that product idea and bring it back into the organization. And like a virus, the organization fully rejected it. The white blood cells could not have hit harder or faster. The marketing team undercut it. We launched that product. It was an app. It was in the App Store. We launched that product without a link to the App Store. I'm just going to let that sink in for a moment. We launched a revenue product in the App Store without a link to the App Store. I will not bore you with the details of why that is. But suffice it to say, it took the New York Times, what, five more years? Cooking, which now everybody celebrates as such a success. Cooking was launched as a free product because NYT Now was such a disaster. Not internally, not within that small group, but once it got back into the bigger organization. And it took them five years to get to the point where they could actually create products that, in, that were made of editorial things, where you could have reporters and editors working with product managers and ad sales and stuff in an, in an effective way. So I would say that the answer to the question is, A, we got to make that wall a little bit more porous. We cannot use it as an excuse not to get involved in revenue generating products and projects. And three, we need to find these areas where you can collaborate across cross-functionally in, um, in, in ways. We need to have rules of engagement around that and find ways to do that um, that are efficient and effective. If you can do those three things, I think you're in much better shape and you're lot gonna look a lot more like courts than you do like other news organizations. Yeah, I, th I think that, um, that that porousness is happening more and more often and I, I keep a long file of like ways my job is weird. There's many ways, but one of the weirder ways, at least to me, like five years ago me, um, is that probably the second or third person I most likely talk to at the AP is our product manager. Um, it's, not a, it's not a reporter, it's not someone technically in our newsroom, um, but I am in daily conversation with him, um, and he is one of the, the most important people I talk to. Tem uma pergunta aqui do Galeno, que é, há um conflito entre produtos, quote unquote, nascidos na redação, histórias em formatos especiais, e produtos novos que são criados pela, pela equipe de produtos. Como conciliar essas duas coisas? So there's a conflict between products that are developed in the newsroom and products... By oh, like product story, like story yeah. forms and things é, like that. Yeah, sim, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sim. We definitely oh, yeah, um, we have run into <laughs> that a million times because someone in marketing or someone in product will be like, we have this great idea that's going to make all sorts of money and it has like zero editorial standards whatsoever. Um, <laughs> you know, or it, you know, it, it conflicts with, with our ability to really be unbiased and, and report the news. Um, so, you know, I, I think at this point, at least in, our, in my relationship with our product team, like they, they very much defer to the newsroom at, at the end of the day. They might come up with a bunch of ideas, um, but at the end of the day, it's a constant conversation. Um, and they understand, like the most important thing AP has is its name and reputation as a, as a massively unbiased news source, and we cannot at, in any way, um, you know, hurt that. É, eu vou fazer uma última pergunta, mas Megan, tem várias perguntas específicas sobre o projeto que vocês vão fazer no Brasil e mais sobre a atuação do seu time. Se você puder ficar mais um pouquinho para poder responder essas perguntas, mas eu queria terminar porque a gente já chegou no tempo é, fazendo é, essa pergunta aqui. Duas perguntas na verdade. Qual o exemplo do Marco, Xará, qual o exemplo de produto nascido numa redação que 
teve grande sucesso nos últimos anos, que vocês admiram muito, e o que é leitura obrigatória para quem quer trabalhar com gerência de produto? So I'll cite membership, the membership program at The Guardian, as arguably the most successful product I've ever had any involvement with. That was fundamentally, it was a collaboration, I won't lie. I mean, it was definitely, but the newsroom, the journalists that were involved in developing that uh, and launching it were uh, instrumental. And the person who runs the, the team, who now is actually in one of those rare, rare people who is not only the product manager, but is also the product owner, Uh, her name is Amanda Mickle. She, she came, her background is, she's a journalist by, by training, but became a product person. Um, and that was, unfortunately, The Guardian had to be five years from extinction to get to the point where we were willing to make these radical changes internally. It was mostly internal that we had to make those changes in order to make, make it work, but that's by far the most successful thing I could point to. Yeah, I would, I, like, nothing is, like, necessary. I mean, there's lots of things I ad admire that um, newsrooms are trying. Podcasts um, it, it's a, it's kind of one that I look at, and I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a good idea. Things like The Daily, um, I think KQED has done a really good job of um, honing in on really local podcasts that have a great, um, you know, have brought in a great uh, audience for them. They're a radio station in San Francisco. Um, so, you know, I, I think that you can kind of see those kinds of, um, of products coming out all the time, that based around our journalism, we're telling stories, we're getting into our communities, um, but we might be doing it in different ways. Any mandatory reading recommendations? <laughs> Uh, my boss would have like a whole book list right now for you. Uh, off the top of my head. Uh, Lean UX yeah. is terrific. Um, uh, there's a couple, bunch of, actually I have, you know what I'm going to do? I have a, uh, a reading I was, list I say, yeah, that I, I could, I'd I be happy if anybody, them. if you have my contact information, I'll tweet it out, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'll tweet it out. Um, uh, but yeah, tons of books, uh, yeah. tons of articles. And I will say, my, my boss made me read the book Drive before I became a manager. <laughs> so that was, that was definitely one of them. It's just basically like what motivates people and um, what keeps people focused. Gente, eu queria agradecer a presença de todos. A gente está no tempo já, três minutos atrasados, mas é, eu queria pedir para a Megan, Megan, se você puder dar uma atenção para o pessoal que quer saber especificamente sobre o projeto da AP no Brasil e também é, e seus projetos. A Megan vai estar aqui para falar com vocês. É, bom intervalo, bom resto de conferência. Pessoal, muito obrigado. Obrigado, Megan. Obrigado, Aaron. Obrigado.